And now I'm going to pass the presenter role to you, Lisa. Uh, there you go. This is the hard part, the technical part. <laughs> no, it's awesome. There you go. We can see your. I can see your screen anyway. So. Okay. And I can hear you. So. Let me try and figure this out. There we go. Can you see my presentation? I can, yes, I can see the. It, for me, it's the whole screen. Uh, folks, if you can't see it, type in the chat for me, and uh, I can see the. It just looks like a slideshow to me right now, Lisa. So it looks like we're good. I'll let you take it away. Great. Um, first of all, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Um, like Sean said, it's you know Wednesday evening in June, and I'm sure not many of us are thinking about curling or curling ice. So um, thank you all for signing up. And it's also really nice to see some names that I recognize. And um, I saw some junior curlers that I know on the list. And uh, that really means a lot to me just to see um, how many of you are investing in your learning in your off season. Um, so thank you to Sean and the Ontario Curling Council for asking me to do this. Um, my first webinar, so please bear with me, but I think we got the technical part out of the way, so we should be smooth sailing now. Um, I've actually been tuning in to a lot of webinars during uh, this time, and um, it's been really nice to be able to use the time where, you know, it's kind of uncertain what's going to happen with the curling season and everything going on in the world to um, focus on some learning and some off-ice skills. Um, and that might be kind of our new reality for a little while. When uh, Sean and I were talking about a topic, we thought that handling adversity would be really timely, um, partly because of what's going on in the world with COVID, um, but also, um, sorry, a little distracting with all the <laughs> things popping up, um, but I don't think you can see those. Anyway, with everything kind of going on in the world with COVID, with my team change, um, it's just, uh, it seems like it's kind of a timely topic to be able to talk about uh, handling adversity. And the time has given me an opportunity to think about my curling career and some lessons. And so I'm excited to be able to share those with you tonight. So tonight I'm going to talk about some failures and some challenging moments I've had in my career and how I've used them to lead to success later on. And I'm hoping that um, some of these messages will resonate for you on and off the ice. And I know we have a mix of athletes and coaches watching, but I think it's going to be relevant for everyone because unfortunately failure and adversity are a universal topic, whether you're an athlete or coach or not, it's just part of the human experience. Let's see if I can change my slide here. All right, guys. All right, so uh, I'm sure I'm not the only one who was watching The Last Dance on Netflix. I think a lot of us have spent a lot of time watching Netflix um, in the last little while. And uh, if you haven't seen this series, I thought it was really great. And I found learning about what drove Michael Jordan to greatness was really inspiring. And to me, he's an athlete who has been deliberate about learning from losing and also about using failure to drive himself to success. I think I kind of agree with him and what his perspective was that it's really important to have opportunities to try things and fail because that's where the learning happens. And whether it's in basketball or curling or another sport, it's relatable because everybody fails at something. You know, sport, academics, career, life, everyone suffers setbacks at one time or another. And it's an opportunity to be resilient and potentially lead us in a new direction. I really believe that moments of adversity and failure can be key opportunities for learning, but only if we use it to our advantage. So if we give up or if we choose not to see the lesson, and it really is a choice, you have to kind of seek out what the lesson is, um, then it can be a waste. So really, to me, the only real failure is not learning from your mistakes. And I think that's something that we don't always do is think about failure systematically or objectively. But if we do, we stand to learn a lot more from it. 
And also if winning was easy, it wouldn't feel special. So sometimes we need those adverse moments and it really makes the winning that much sweeter. So Sean went over my bio a little bit in my intro. And uh, when I was putting it together, I was kind of thinking about when we do put together a bio or a CV, that we're always putting our highlights and our accomplishments, and we're trying to show ourselves in really the best possible light. Um, but what we often don't see with people are their failures, their setbacks, and their lowlights. But for me, I've put mine on here, and uh, I know Sean only went over the highlights, but there's some of these losses that actually led to success in the future. And I, I know the, the timeline's not on here in the years, but for example, I won a bronze medal and then a silver medal before I was able to be world champion. And looking at the Olympic trials in 2013, my team lost and that learning from that experience really helped drive us to success in 2017. And so that's something I'm going to talk about uh, a bit more in depth as we go along. So I just put this up here because I wanted to show that sometimes what we see on the surface with people isn't the whole story. And there's a lot that of failure that and loss that goes on behind it and a lot of hard work too. Um, I also think that with social media, we've kind of got this culture where we're trying to put out these perfect curated images of ourselves and nobody wants to feel weak or look vulnerable or look like they're not good enough. So tonight I'm going to do something a little different for me and that's be vulnerable with you and share um, some of my losses and what I've learned from them. So I think everyone's probably seen um, this image before and it's kind of like a funny dramatic to show the idea of success and on the left showing people think it looks like you know a straight line from point b and on the right that uh you know it's a little bit messier than that so i don't really agree with one necessarily i think that maybe the path isn't quite as random as um, the picture depicting what it really looks like. I also don't think it's quite as linear as the one on the left. Um, so I actually took the time to plot out what I thought maybe my path would look like. And bear with me, I'm not really a great computer graphics person, so this was my best effort. Um, but looking at this, I saw that I was able to identify some key successes and failures in my career and be able to identify some moments of failure that led to a success later on. So it was interesting going through this because I felt that some moments that I might have looked at as a failure a while ago, like, or in the moment, for example, a bronze medal at the world championship when we were pretty close to going forward to the gold medal game like at the time that kind of felt like a failure but now looking back at my career and seeing that I was able to win a bronze medal at my first world championship I would say that's a pretty big accomplishment so it's interesting how with time it can kind of change our perspective um and the other thing going through this I noted is that the bar continually is raised depending on where you are in your sort of timeline so for example, after you've won a world championship, that's kind of like the level of success that you're expecting every single season. So I'm going to go through a few moments and I've put stars on some of the ones that I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, but as I go through, I want you to think about also what your own timeline would look like. And if you're able to identify some key moments, both failures and successes, and also reflect on how you've been able to use your own failures as learning opportunities. Um, now I wanted to go through and come up with a few themes as I was um, going through my presentation and the ideas of support and of gratitude and of mindset kind of kept coming back and some of the stories that I was thinking of. And so when I put this here, I want to make it clear that these aren't 
kind of the, this isn't an exhaustive list of how to overcome adversity. But for me, I found that these were three keys and three themes that keep coming back through my career. So the first one is surround yourself with the right people. And I think that a strong support network is super, super important. So whether that's parents or siblings or coaches or teammates or friends, um, it's those people that you can really count on when you are in a tough time. And another part of that, and I think what's almost most important, is who's going to be honest with you, sometimes at the expense of your feelings, to help you grow. And then on the flip side of that, think about how you are a support person to the most important people in your life. And whether that's being a coach or a parent or a teammate or a friend, think about what some of the things that you do are to support the people in your circle and maybe how you could be better at that when they need you. The second point was find perspective. And I wanted to look up the definition of perspective, and I found two. One was a particular way of considering something. And another one was to think about a situation or problem in a wise and reasonable way. And I thought that was kind of a nice way to look at it as being wise and reasonable when having perspective. Um, I really feel like perspective is almost like a sister to gratitude and appreciation that kind of the three of them really work together. But perspective is the one that you need to draw on in hard times. And in challenging moments, sometimes it's really hard to have perspective. I think it gets easier with time and with age and maturity and, unfortunately, with more failure. But the good news is anyone can find it, and sometimes it takes your support network to help you. And then thirdly, focus on what you can control and let go of what you have no control over. And this has been something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about lately. Um, in life, we there's a lot of things that we do have control over and lots of things that we don't. And I think it's so important to understand the difference and choose to focus our time on what we control. So for me, I know that I control my words, my actions, and my attitude. Those are all things that are within my power. And there's lots that I don't control, right? Other people's actions, what they say, what their opinions are what they write online, what's written in the media. So it's easy to let your mind go there and start kind of obsessing over those things. So I find I have to make a really conscious effort to turn it around and focus on what I do control. And this is something that honestly takes a lot of work and a lot of practice, and I'm definitely not perfect at it. But I do find that going through some difficult moments, um, that this is a skill that's really helped. So I'm going to go through a few stories now from my curling career. And my first one, I'm sure even if you've never met him, you guys can probably figure out that that's my dad. There's a little bit of a family resemblance there. Um, and this story is really about this loony. Um, when I, I started curling when I was eight and started playing in some little skills in the club and outside the club. And um, I remember we were playing in this event outside the club and there were cash prizes for the teams and my team came in dead last and we were actually called up to receive a prize and it was four dollars it was this envelope with four loonies in it and I was humiliated and I remember I cried on the way home I didn't want this dollar and uh, my dad told me to take the dollar and keep it somewhere safe and that when I looked at it, I would be able to look back one day and think about how far I'd come. Now, I don't know why I listened to him on that particular day, but it seemed, I guess, significant at the time. And so I kept it in my sock drawer and it made every single move with me. Um, and I don't look at it often, but it's kind of funny now that I can look at it and uh, think back that this really was a pivotal moment in my life because it set a foundation for me on my perspective on failure. So my dad showed me that it's okay to feel however you want to feel. You can be sad, frustrated, and disappointed. 
And you can give yourself some time to feel that way, but also that the feeling isn't permanent. Another thing that he did was he didn't try to make excuses to spare my feelings, to tell me that it wasn't my fault that we lost, that it was my teammates that played poorly, or that the draw was unfair, we had to play all the top teams, or the other team got lucky, or any other number of excuses, which I'm sure we've all heard people say, or we've all said ourselves at some point. I think that sometimes when we see the people that we love are in pain, we want to say things to make them feel better and make ourselves feel better and make it feel like it isn't their fault that they didn't measure up. But I really think it's important to be honest if we're really going to help people learn from failure. So if I take that back to my three main points, um, the first one about support, surround yourself with the right people. So I didn't choose my dad, but I was very lucky in that I had parents with wisdom and perspective, and most importantly, that were willing to invest time to help me learn and grow. My dad did not have to respond in that situation the way he did, but he chose to. So I want to emphasize for parents and coaches out there that that's something to think about, that you never know when a lesson is going to be the one that makes the most impact. My family was over um, last weekend for Father's Day, and I asked my dad if, or my parents if they remembered this, and they didn't because they said there were so many spiels that either we were going home in silence or in tears and so many events that I came in last. So it's kind of funny that a moment that, you know, wasn't really significant for them really was for me. And then this, on the second point about perspective, at 12 years old, a loss like this kind of feels like the end of the world and seems like a big deal. And today I'm 35 and it seems kind of silly for me to be telling you guys a story about a loss I had when I was 12 and I was just learning to curl. Um, But I just kind of, that's the thing with perspective is it changes over time and it's okay to be upset after a loss. It means you care. And to this day, I'm still upset after every single loss. And it's okay to let yourself feel however it is you want to feel, but also keep in mind that it won't last forever and it's within your control. It's your choice to move on. And that's the third point is focus on what you can control. So that moment in that car ride home, the spiel was over. We couldn't go back and replay it to get a different result. I had zero control over the past, but what I could control was my reaction and what I did with that dollar what I chose to have it signify. And yeah, there we go. One day I can look back and have a different perspective on all this. I had to dig really deep in the archives for these photos, so I really apologize. The one on the left probably looks like it was taken about 100 years ago, (laughs) but I promise you it wasn't. Um, This was my junior team, and we played together for six years, and we had Uh, a pretty good team. And I remember I wanted so badly to go to junior nationals. That that was my really big goal. And as you can see from the windbreakers that we're wearing, um, our jackets didn't look like what junior jackets look like today. I I went and watched uh, some of the competition in Guelph over Christmas and was really amazed at how professional everyone looked compared to back when I was in juniors. So I really wanted to earn an Ontario jacket with my name on the back. And we lost the provincial final two years in a row. And that, at the time, really did feel like the end of the world to me. And thinking about perspective, like at that time, it really was a big part of my world. And again, like more tears in the car on the way home and um, having to decide in that moment is that feeling worth it? Like, do I still want to keep trying, um, even though it means you're going to lose and feel that heartbreak? But for me, the thrill of winning has always been worth chasing, even if it means suffering the pain of losing. And one more little note on perspective, because I know there's some juniors out there listening. And for me, I think part of why I was so upset was because I felt like I needed to be like I needed to be successful in juniors. And that meant going to junior nationals in order to be successful in women's. And I will tell you guys that of 
all of the Canadian curling athletes in Pyeongchang at the Olympics, I was the only one who didn't go to junior nationals. So everyone's path to success is different is kind of what I want to share with you is that it's okay if your path maybe doesn't quite go the way you think it should or hope it should or that maybe others think that it should that there's lots of different ways to achieve your goals, but sometimes maybe you're just working on a different version of your timeline. So my path, my timeline continued on after juniors and I actually kind of like stepped away from competitive curling for a little while. I took some time to focus on school. I finished my communications degree and I ended up getting a full-time job in the government. And I kept curling, but not at that same level. Like I played in cash league and I played a few spiels a year and play downs, but that was kind of it. And there were a few moments that really inspired me. And one of them was uh, watching Jen Hanna and Jennifer Jones play in that famous final in 2005, which I'm sure a lot of you remember. Um, I was in university at the time. And Jen was a member of my club and uh, I had this like sense of pride that she was from my club and I had actually learned to curl little rocks from her parents. So for me, seeing that and having, you know, someone that I knew and had looked up to do something so successful, I felt like that dream wasn't so far out of reach for me. And I think that that's the power of having positive role models. And another thing I remember is she came back and had this Scotty's necklace on and told the story about how when you win the provincials, you get this pendant. And then every time you win the provincial, you get a diamond to fill it in. And I hadn't heard that before. And so I really wanted to play for this necklace. And then another moment was watching the 2010 Olympics. And at that time, I was working for Sport Canada. and being there and watching it and working in sport, it made me realize that I still had that dream inside me to go to the Olympics and to go to the Scotties. And in fact, one of my colleagues knew that was my dream and he was working in Vancouver and brought back this poster that was signed by Cheryl Bernard's Olympic team. And that poster hung in my office and I looked at it every day for inspiration, motivation. And it was just a few months after the Olympics that I got a call from Rachel Holman while I was sitting at work, looking at my Olympic poster, sitting at my desk and asking me to join her team. And that phone call really changed my life. So at the start, I'll tell you, oh, I didn't want to go to that quite yet. Sorry. At the start, it was a struggle. It's hard to find where you fit in on a new team. And uh, it's, it took a lot for me to get into game shape. I definitely wasn't the best player that they could have selected at the time. Uh, I remember the first event that we flew to, and that was a really big deal for me because I'd never taken a plane to curl. We went to Winnipeg for this ladies' field, and there I was surrounded on the, on the ice by Jennifer Jones and Cheryl Bernard, and just felt like so far out of my league. And Andrea Ronnebeck was our coach that season, and I remember her telling me that I had a lot of work to do if I wanted to compete at this level. And it might seem harsh, but it was actually really refreshing and helpful for her to be honest with me. And then not only did she say that, but we worked on a plan for me to get better. And I had the support from my teammates and my coach to be able to improve. So I had the drive, but I still needed that support network around me to, to get there. Which takes us to our next slide. There we go. So our first year, we made it to the Scotties, which was pretty incredible. And there I was. I finally got my Ontario jacket with my name on the back. And you better believe I took that picture the second I was able to get my jacket and put it on and I got my Scotty's necklace. And um, it was so amazing, this feeling of accomplishing a goal that I'd had for myself. Um, and I know I'm kind of like skipping over a lot of parts of my story. Like there was a lot of hard work that went in to get there, but we only have an hour and I have 
a lot of ground to cover. Um, so that year we uh, lost the semifinal, but coming so close helped me feel like I finally belonged. And that also gave me the confidence to reach for a higher goal that I wanted to now win the Scotties, that just being there wasn't enough. Um, I wanted more and I was ready to work for it. Change, sorry. There we go. So I'm going to fast forward in my timeline here. In 2012, the following year, we actually lost the provincial final. We didn't make it back to the Scotties. And in 2013, we did. We won the provincials and then we actually won the Scotties against Jennifer Jones. And um, that year, Earl came back on board as our coach. We started using the tick shot and the way that you guys kind of know it now is like in different situations throughout the game, not just in the last end. And I finally started to feel like I was becoming a top lead. Um, and that year we went on to win a bronze at Worlds. 2013 was also the year of the Olympic trials. And we went in as one of the favorites, um, partly because we just won the Scotties that year. And Jennifer Jones was also a favorite. And we were playing the trials in her hometown in Winnipeg. And I went into the trials, I remember feeling really nervous. And in hindsight, I think I was playing not to lose instead of playing to win. And that's a really important distinction. Instead of being in the moment, you're thinking about the past or the future or thinking about outcomes. And so I think that that's a really important skill to train to be able to be in the moment. It's not just something that you can expect to be there for you in big moments. You have to rehearse it and you have to master it. And I'm going to be pretty vulnerable and honest here with you guys. I My mindset at that time was that I had to be an Olympian, that I needed it to be a part of my identity. I needed it to validate the work that I'd been putting in and for the people who'd been supporting me and believing in me. And I had this goal and it was closer than ever. And I wanted it so badly, like too badly. And uh, as you can see from the picture at the bottom, handshakes, we lost the semifinal to Sherry Madaw. And that's it. Just like that, your Olympic dream is over for four more years. I'm having a little trouble with my transitions here. Okay. So um, after the season, we did a gap analysis. And it was a pretty big season, like the year, at least 2013, where there were some successes, but also some failures. So I'm sure this is something that is familiar to a lot of you, a gap analysis. And if you're not, I would encourage you to get familiar um, it's really simple looking at what your strengths are as an individual and as a team, and then your weaknesses or your areas for improvement as an individual and as a team. And then I put a few notes on the side. So some of the things I think are important when doing a gap analysis is you prioritize. So maybe you have like 20 gaps, but maybe you just need to pick the top three that are going to have the biggest payoff. You need to plan, so write it down, create your plan, figure out who your support team is, who's gonna help you, and then act. So this was another theme, I almost put it down as one of my keys, is just taking action, that just because you want it or you wish it or you dream it to happen, you need to take action. So, um, you know, just act on your plan, carry it out, and then review it. So it's important, you know, I feel like a lot of times we write these great plans, we have all these great ideas, and then it gets left in a desk drawer somewhere, or it's a file on your computer that you never open again. So make sure you're constantly going back and reviewing and revising and assessing if you're actually um, following through on your gap analysis. So that year in 2013, I remember we had a lot of really hard conversations about what we each needed to do to improve. And we created this four-year plan in order to win in 2017. 
So, I mean, you can see some differences pretty clearly here. I thought it was kind of neat that this picture was, these pictures are four years apart, but kind of framed in a similar way. Um, so you can see like we changed a player. Joanne joined the team and Allison uh, moved to Sweden. I switched sides for sweeping. Um, there's a lot of things that were different also that you can't see. Um, we tried a whole bunch of new things. We started meditating. I worked with a sleep specialist because I was having trouble falling asleep the nights before big games. I started a gratitude journal. We got a new trainer, a nutritionist. We had coaching changes. We had Marcel, then we had Adam. Um, worked on, you know, all those areas of the game that everyone works on too, dy team dynamics or debriefs or communication or technical or sweeping. Like we looked at every single area of the game and tried to find ways to improve. And I was thinking about this. I was reading this book about habits the other day called Atomic Habits. And the author had this idea in there about being 1% better at things. And I really like that because I think sometimes when we look at our gap analysis or all these things that we want to improve or we want to try a new skill that we're like all in 100% and then you fail a little bit and then just kind of back off of it. So I think the idea of just making little improvements every single day, um, you can watch them accumulate and uh, that can have a huge payoff. So I walked into the trials in 2017 with a completely different mindset. This time I didn't feel like I needed to win. Did I want to win? Of course. But now I felt like I could play to win instead of not to lose. I had so much confidence in my team and in our preparation that I really wasn't all that worried about the outcome. And when I talked about that mindset and training to stay in the moment, I had now four more years of training to be able to do that. So when negative thoughts would come in, I'd be able to redirect them and focus on what I needed to. I wanted to share this with you. This was an exercise I did with Kyle Paquette, who's one of our mental performance consultants. And this was just a simple little exercise that we did that actually helped give me so much perspective heading into the trials. So he asked me to visualize two scenarios. So that final rock of the trials final comes to rest and one of two things is gonna happen. You're either gonna win or you're gonna lose. So visualize what does your life look like? Two minutes, two days, or two hours, two days, two weeks, two months, and two years after the trial's final. And I know what some of you are probably thinking, because I thought it too, is why would I want to visualize something negative happening? And I would say that if you're trying to visualize yourself doing a skill, like thinking about throwing your draws, of course, you would want to see yourself do them perfectly every single time. You'd never want to visualize yourself doing a skill incorrectly. But for this, it helped almost like free me up a little bit that I was able to see what my life looked like and also to plan for it. So I actually wrote down a plan for what would happen after we lost and what I wanted in, you know, these time periods after and shared it with my husband. So he knew how to best support me. I think that, you know, when you put it all down on paper like that, it helps give some perspective. And the other thing that I did was I realized that in the two minutes, you know, two hours, two days, it all looked very different. But two years after really wasn't all that different. And I also wrote down all of the great things that had happened in my life since the trials in 2013. And being able to look at that list gave me some confidence to think that even if we lost this trials final, I would still be okay that there's still going to be more great things that happen because it just happened in the last four years. So here we are, we're at the trials. And uh, I felt really confident in our preparation. And in fact, the night before the trials started, our support team of Kyle and Adam had actually planned a celebration for us. Um, so I'm not sure what the other teams were doing, but I think we were probably the only team that had a glass of champagne and we toasted to all the work we'd done and to the people that we had become over the last four years. 
And like, what a different feeling and what a way to start off the event was just feeling like a full team unit, confident in each other. I felt fully prepared. I believed in our plan. And most importantly, I didn't feel like I needed to be an Olympian this time around. Of course, I still wanted it. But I really believe that the feeling of needing to win versus wanting to win gives you a huge difference in your mindset. And one of the things that I talked about at the beginning was support and that kind of being able to focus on others and focus on the support we had actually took some of the pressure away of having to perform in front of a home crowd because that was a huge storyline leading up to this event. I took the perspective that it might be my only chance to play a big event in Ottawa, that it might be one of my only opportunities for these friends of mine here who don't curl to see me play live at home. And so I just focused on trying to feel grateful and being in that arena and having people cheering for us and took the time after games to sign autographs, to talk to kids and to talk to fans. And I think making that experience enjoyable for them was also making it enjoyable for me. So on the ice, we actually lost our first game to Chelsea Carey. And I think we could have made a big deal about it, but we didn't because it was part of the plan. And I'm not talking about losing that specific game, but we had talked about the fact that it was a really tough field and that likely nobody was going to go through undefeated and we were expecting to lose games. So we knew that job number one was to make playoffs and whether that was through a tiebreaker or going first overall, we were going to be happy and we were going to take it. And I remember the morning of the final waking up and we had rented this house in Canada. We were all staying at a house and I was nervous, but I was really more excited than anything I wanted to go put on a show. And I knew that we were going to give it our best. And I also felt confident that if we played our best game, nobody else's best game would beat ours. And that might sound a little cocky, but we had put in the work to be able to back it up and to feel that way at that time. So when we got out there on the ice, the last thing we said to each other before the game was, let's enjoy this moment and let's play for each other. And of course I was nervous, but I actually let myself just play free and enjoy the game. And I can tell you there's only been a few games I've ever felt that way. And that was one of them. And I haven't always enjoyed big games. Like I would kind of wake up in the morning of a big game and have this feeling like I just wanted to like rush through the day and get to the end and know what, the result was going to be win or lose. I just didn't like that suspense, but I was able to kind of just like enjoy it. And I'll tell you, I thought I was going to barf before my last two shots in the 10th end. And it really took all of my mental training and all my skills to be able to get myself back into the moment. Um, but I did. And we got to experience this, all that emotion. And this really was kind of a picture of one of the best moments of my life because it represented to me hard work and teamwork and perfect planning and being able to be there and to win with friends and family there was just the highlight of my career. So I wanted to share this with you and go in a bit of detail here because this was the story of how we were able to use moments of failure, like those 2013 trials and really all the little big and all the losses along the way as learning opportunities to lead to change. And thinking back to even that season in 2017 before the trials, we didn't have a great season. We didn't do very well at the slams. And there was, you know, people who thought that we were heading in kind of cold, but for us, it was just part of our plan that we stayed really confident in it and we believed in the plan and we believed in each other and that we were each going to do what we needed to do to win the trials. So there was a really short turnaround to the Olympics, right? The trials are in December and then it's Christmas and 
there's all kinds of like invitations and events and things that you want to take advantage of all these opportunities because as we know the opportunity to be a Canadian Olympian in curling only happens once for most people so we wanted to take advantage of those opportunities but we also needed to prepare so I want you to imagine put yourself in my shoes for a second and you're Canadian Olympian you're heading to the Olympics in curling and you're wearing the maple leaf, you're living in the athlete village, you're surrounded by all these amazing athletes you've watched on TV, you're walking in the opening ceremony, like every moment is just so exciting and you really feel like you're living your dream. So now I want you to imagine that you're 0-3 in your bond field, that you've lost your first three games at the Olympics and how would you feel? Right, this Olympic dream is starting to feel a little bit like a nightmare. There is so much pressure on you. You've never felt it like that before. You and your team are expected to win gold and you expect it of yourself. And you know that a bronze or a silver is just not going to be good enough. And being off the podium is just unthinkable. And now you're 0 and 3. And everyone in the media and on social media are coming up with reasons why you're losing. And, there, you know, it's really easy to judge and comment from the sidelines that sometimes I think we forget that athletes are real people just out there trying to do their best. So these storylines and this negativity start to seep into how you feel about yourself and start to affect your confidence. And you find yourself asking yourself, like, should I even be here? Would another team do better? Why aren't we winning? And most of all, you just don't want to let anyone down. So as you can imagine, you know, not the greatest feelings going on there. So after our third loss, I'll tell you guys this story. We met in the locker room and it was just the four of us. And we sat in silence for a while and then we went into problem solving mode. So we acknowledged that we weren't losing by much, but that didn't matter. What matters is you need to get the win on the board. Um, so we looked at almost like a gap analysis. What can each of us do to get a few more percentage points and a few more points on the board? What can we do individually? What can we do as a team? And one of the things about the Olympics is you can't just go where you want to go. Like There's all these security bubbles and rules about where you're allowed to be and so there's no patch like to go and see your family you have to plan it and go to this place called Canada House and so we had planned a few times in our calendar when we were going to go and after that game was one of them but now we're sitting there at 0 and 3 and not entirely sure if that's where we want to be so we talked about it and we decided no you know what, these people have flown across the world for us and this is their dream too and we should go see them. And as much as like I wanted to crawl in a hole and not chit chat, it was actually the perspective that I think we all needed at the time. And we actually started to turn it around after that. We went on a winning streak and we started to believe in ourselves and I think Canada started to believe in us too. But I'll tell you guys, like, we just had to stay in the moment because that was really all you had was you can't change the past. You can't go back and replay those three games and you can't worry about the future. So I wish I was telling you the story of how we turned it around and won a gold medal, but that's not the story tonight. Um, in our second last game, we lost to Great Britain. It was a really close game and that put us out of contention. It was just one loss too many. And, uh, I will tell you that was probably like one of the lowest points in my life. It was pretty devastating and I tried to hold it together. You can see I'm holding it in in that photo and, um, went back to the room and had a really big cry. And really at a time like that, there's nothing anyone can say, right? And I think that lots of people don't even try to reach out because they're afraid to say the wrong thing. But having gone through this, like I honestly believe there's really no right thing to say, but when someone's failed or suffered a loss, I think that anything, even saying the wrong thing, is better than silence because it shows you care. 
So I want to share with you a message that I got from this 18 year old girl. And she sent this to me. I got it kind of like maybe an hour after the game. So it says, hey, Lisa, despite the outcome this week, I'm so proud of everything you and the team have accomplished. You girls were the first team little 10 year old me looked up to. And you have inspired and taught me so much since then. Lessons more important than winning. Among other things, you showed me what it means to be a great teammate and what it means to work hard and persevere right until the very end. Canadian Olympian, you earn that title. And I, along with all Canadians, take pride in having such amazing role models representing our country. You will always be one of my biggest idols and I will always be cheering for you. So that is pretty incredible. And seeing that message, of course, made me cry again, but it didn't take away the sting of losing, but it gave me a little bit of perspective. And I often think about how much that message meant for me in the moment. And I try to be that person for others when I can to reach out and say something, even when it's difficult to find the words. And I think it's important to remember that in times that are difficult, we can all reach out and make a difference. Now, after the Olympics, I will be honest, I was pretty depressed and devastated for quite a while after. Um, you get all these like amazing Team Canada clothes to wear kind of off the ice and I wouldn't even wear them because for me, it was just a reminder of the fact that we didn't win. And, you know, we all love sport and curling and medals are super important to Canada, but with time, for me, I was able to gain perspective and just having to remind myself that it's sport. I think that we put a lot of pressure on athletes to win gold or it's a failure. And the reality of the situation is like at the Olympics, one team's going to win gold and nine are going to be disappointed. And it's the same with kind of every curling event or every sport event. There's going to be one winner. And if you don't enjoy the journey, I think you can look at these events as failures, but that is about your perspective and your mindset. I remember the closing ceremonies looking around and it was the minority of athletes who had medals on and looking at all the athletes, you know, these people who are at the top of their game, they're Olympians and I wouldn't consider them failures. So, you know, why was I thinking about myself in that way? Sometimes you just have a bad week and sometimes you know, the outcome in sport is just never a guarantee, but that's why we play it. So for me, I know that I can look in the mirror and know that I tried everything in my power to win. And after the Olympics, I didn't give up. I went back out and I kept playing. And I'll tell you that those feelings and memories still fade over time, but they stick with you. And it's up to you how you want to manage them. And for me, I'm so proud to be an Olympian. And regardless of the result today, I choose to see it as a major accomplishment. So in my little timeline, we're heading back up to the present moment. Um, there was a little slump there for a little while. We uh, lost the Scotties final in 2019, and then we lost it again in 2020. And uh, sometimes sport just works that way. Like for me, I felt like and kind of history had shown me in my timeline that after a big loss, there was usually a big win coming. And so I had felt like after the Olympics that a big one was coming and it feels horrible to lose two finals in a row. Um, but just because you've lost one doesn't mean you're going to win the next one. Right. It, you're not owed anything. And so then in March, I get this phone call from my team that they've decided to let me go. And like, that was tough. That was a moment that felt like I got fired, like I got dumped, like I lost my best friends. And it was just all kind of in an instant out of the blue. Um, just like that phone call from Rachel changed my life in 2010. This one changed my life too. So looking at it through my framework, the first one, surround yourself with the right people or with the, yeah, with the right people. So I really leaned on my husband and my friends and my family in the days that followed. And um, 
it was really important for me to be able to spend time with them and uh, to have their support. And actually the night that the announcement went off, I went over to a friend's place and uh, like it was tough, but we also toasted to my career. And that's the kind of perspective and support that you need to have in moments like that. I remember the next night I went over to have dinner with some of my girlfriends and they bought me flowers. And of course that made me cry, but it wasn't, because I was necessarily sad about Team Holman, it was just like feeling overwhelmed by their love and support. And I also received so many messages during that time. And it meant a lot to me, like it took me a while to get through them and respond to them. But being able to kind of feel loved and appreciated wasn't something that I had expected to receive after that phone call. But that was actually kind of a gift that I got through that. And then so for perspective, I chose to focus on all the amazing things I'd accomplished over what I was losing. And it helped that I was able to have lots of conversations and give some media interviews where I looked back on my career and I really am proud. Like I was able to do so many amazing things and I didn't want to lose that in what people might try and turn into like this juicy story that it really just wasn't. Um, so honestly, I am really proud of all that we accomplished and I chose in that moment and I continue to choose for that to be the focus. Another part of my perspective was just thinking that in the overall picture of my life, my time on Team Holman is just a small part. It's a chapter and I get to write the rest. It's an important chapter, but it's not the whole story. And so like I had let go of that feeling of needing to be an Olympian, to be part of my identity. I know that I'm so much more than just a curler or just a member of Team Holman or whatever, you know, that part of your identity is that you find yourself holding on to. So it's really important, I think, to keep balance in your life and take care of all those areas, not just curling. And that's really important to have when you're going through a loss. And then finally, to let go of what you don't control. I had no control over the decision and I had to figure out a way to let go of that and consciously choose to let it go. And I wrote down a list of the things that I control, like my thoughts and my actions and my goals and chose to focus on that. And I also had control over what I did next. So I took the time to think about what I wanted to do and made the decision that I wanted to continue curling and made the decision to join Team Jones. And now I'm all in like full steam ahead Team Jones, and I'm making the choice every single day to focus on my future and not live in my past. So I wanted to finish with a little quote from a basketball coach. We started with basketball. We're going to end with basketball. And this one's a coach, John Wooden. And I think his quote here sums it up pretty nicely, that losing is temporary. He's saying you should learn from it. And then let it go. And that's about your mindset. So whatever your situation is and wherever you are on your timeline, just keep in mind that it's not permanent. And the low times aren't going to last forever, but sadly, neither will the good. So I know that as my timeline continues, I'm going to have more disappointment and more failure, but I'm also going to have more wins and more special moments. And sometimes the difference between the two, between a positive moment and a negative one, can just be how you think about it. So all we can really do is live in the moment and enjoy the journey. And I think that's something that I haven't done enough of during my curling career, that I've spent so much time chasing my goals and raising the bar and my expectations of myself and what success looks like that sometimes you just need a little reminder to slow down and enjoy it. Success can't look like just Olympic gold or nothing because I think you're going to miss out on all those little moments and those special moments along the way. So just remember, I hope you remember this from this talk, is that, you know, we're all going to fail and it's part of being human and you get to choose what happens next. So make sure you surround yourself with the right people, find your perspective and focus on what you can control. And most importantly, keep learning and choose to find the lesson to keep moving forward. Can I flip this back to you, Sean? Yeah, uh, why don't we, can I leave that? Uh...
slide up there just yeah. while we while we entertain questions. So if mm-hmm. it's all right, I'm going to ask I'm going to unmute everybody who's who I've muted. Um, if you this might take me a second because I like uh, did it one by one. But uh, uh, slowly as I unmute, if folks want to uh, ask Lisa questions, uh, we'll take some time and uh, yeah. Hang on, I'm just going to. I'm happy to take any questions. It can be related to what I talked about or anything else too. So you can un you can uh sorry, Andrea says, What great messages. Thank you so much, Lisa. Yes, I should have said that. Uh <laughs> I very much appreciated the talk. I was I was completely engaged and completely engrossed in everything you're saying. So um I'm sure our audience was as well. <laughs> Everyone who was um muted is now unmuted. So uh let the frenzy begin. If you'd like to ask Lisa a question, please go ahead. Lisa, we have a question in the chat, and it's from Dolores, and she's asking, what do you do daily to keep mentally on track? Um, for me, journaling is a really um, big part of my life, and actually since COVID, um, I've really reengaged with that. So daily, I actually uh, write down a few goals for myself because I was finding with no routine and not a lot of direction and not a lot of purpose, especially at the beginning of the quarantine, that I really needed to write down some things to keep myself on track. And some days they were really simple and some days they were a little more ambitious. But I think it's important to have your goals and continue to um, work towards achieving them. And then another thing that I do daily is uh, meditation. And I use an app called Headspace and that's been a huge part of my training, and I find that's really helpful in curling, but also in life, just to um, keep yourself in the moment. Can I ask you a question myself? Sure, yeah. Um, you mentioned, I, now I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to get the name of it wrong, but I think you called it a gratitude journal. Mm-hmm. Can you Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so, I mean, if you look, Online, there's lots that you can order from Amazon or whatever, but um, basically it's writing down a few things that you're grateful for each day. Um, And I find that really kind of connects you to the present and just makes you appreciate kind of what you have now in your life instead of always just thinking about what's missing or what's not there, what you're trying to achieve. Thank you. Uh, folks, um, we got a few more minutes. If you want to ask a few more questions, anybody, fire away. It's Andrea. Hi, Andrea. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> how are you? Good. How are you? Awesome. Awesome messages. Thank you so much. I do have a question about the Olympics. Mm-hmm. Um, the team around you changed so much. Your support team changed so much going from the you know the lead up and the trials right to the Olympics and I'm not looking for an excuse that's that's not it at all but what did did that did that have an impact was that something that you felt prepared going into or was it something that um, kind of came out of the blue yeah you know that's a good question it's something that I've reflected on a lot since and it's kind of easy in hindsight to be able to say that you know that was a problem or that was a reason but um, in the moment, you just kind of get swept up in this big, like, Olympic machine, and um, mm-hmm. you you lose control over your decisions. So where with the trials, we had what I would call near-perfect planning. We hadn't really planned that much for the Olympics, that we had just trusted that the plans were going to be made for us. And, mm-hmm. yeah, I think when you're changing so many things heading into a bigger yeah, event, it's it, it, changes kind of how you feel about it your mental like your mindset so I would say it definitely wouldn't be a best practice that you know before major events that you would be changing your support team around you having not worked with some of them before but it's hard to train for an Olympic event like with so many great teams in Canada um, it's just it's a difficult situation I think for uh, curling Canada and for the players Absolutely. They were they were they were putting the best people there. It was just a matter of anticipating, right? Mhm. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
So Lisa, a couple other questions in the chat. Um, the first one is, I'm gonna, I'm not sure, I, I think maybe it, there was a spelling mistake, but uh, how do you compare, I think it's your fear of losing with a want to win mentally that change between the two trials? That's what the question says. Okay. Um, I think for me, it was a lot of doing these perspective activities and just having to, realize that I am just, you know, I'm okay with not necessarily being an Olympian is that if that's something that doesn't happen in my life, that that's okay. And so that I was able to kind of train and develop my mental skills in order to really just feel like, yeah, I want to win, but if I don't, my life's going to be okay too. Great. Um, another question then, the question is, how are you handling seeing the girls socially now? I'm presuming they mean Team Holman. Um, yeah, well, I'm not really seeing anyone socially right now, so uh, <laughs> it's difficult. But, um, you know, I still, we talk every once in a while, and we've talked since. And um, I'm sure it'll be a little strange the first time we see them out on the ice. But, um, you know, we're all professionals, and we're all moving forward. Great. Questions are popping up all over the place, so I'm going to get to each Great. one of them as quick as I can. Uh, <laughs> uh, the question is, next question is, how how do you prepare for a five-person team? Will it be different than a person than a team of four, or will the focus be the same? And there was a thank you for chatting. Oh. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, our preparation right now is honestly just trying to figure out what events are going to go forward and what that's going to look like. Um, but it's been very clear since the beginning that I'm fully integrated as a member of the team, that this is a five person team. Um, so we've been having lots of calls, talking about strategy, team dynamics, all the things that you would expect, you know, a high performance curling team to be talking about. And once we get closer to the season, we'll see what that looks like. Great. Uh, next question. When switching teams, do you adopt the new team's habits and practices or do you keep your own or is it a combination of both? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm joining one of the best teams in the world. So, you know, I, I'm really interested to learn from them. And they're really interested to learn from me, which has been um, a really great dynamic coming into the team. So we've already had conversations where they've talked about some of their routines and their habits. And I've talked about some of the things that I've done as part of Team Holman. And everyone seems open to just selecting whatever makes the most sense for our team, but also is going to help us win. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do is win a championship. Great. Uh, the last comment, I think it's a comment, um, and then I'll ask one more time for questions, uh, is from Sissy, Sissy Wyatt. I think that's right. Hopefully, Sissy, I hope that's right. All she says is, hi, all. Hi, Lisa. I'm a 12-year-old girl from Alberta. Just wanted to thank you for being so open and honest. Oh, thank you. You know, I was like a little bit worried when I was writing this presentation because I really am being very open and honest and how it would be received. But, um, you know, thank you for your comment. It's not easy to be vulnerable, but I think it's also important to share experiences like this and hopefully help some other people like you. So, folks, I'm going to ask one last call for questions. If not, I'm going to thank Lisa very much for your vulnerability tonight and your information and all, all the great stories and all the great insight. I, I personally feel uh, a lot better prepared. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, oh, hang on. One more. Lisa, it's Laura from Ottawa. What are some things you do during the off-season summer to prepare for the upcoming season, both mentally and physically? I, that's a big one, but I'll let you take that. Mm -hmm. Hi, Laura. Um, some of the things I do in the off season. So, well, I've been working out. Um, so for physical training, we made a little gym in our basement. So I've been trying to do that as well as I can during, you know, kind of like this lockdown situation. Um, and then mentally, a lot of, um, like I talked about, kind of like journaling, headspace, visualization, just like making sure that I'm in the best mental and physical shape heading into the season. That's great. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, folks, um, a couple more comments of thank yous, Lisa, and, and great insights. And um, final call, folks.
And if that's everything, once again, on behalf of the OCC and me personally, I really want to thank you, Lisa. This was really a great presentation. Uh, the message was great. The presentation was great. I, I, I'm very pleased to have been able to do this one. So thanks, Andrea, for letting me do this one. <laughs> um, well, thanks for asking me. And also thank you, everyone, for the questions and the comments. OK, folks, thanks for attending. Um, that concludes the meeting. And uh, we appreciate you uh, your participation. Thanks, everyone.